This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Nick Chater, who is a professor at the Behavioral Science Group at Work Business School, and also the author of this book right here, uh, The Mind is, is Flat. The Remarkable Shallowness of the Improv- improvising brain, Nick. This, uh, you know, uh, this this book um, was it on the one hand uh, very di- you know disheartening because it it highlights kind of the the you know the the lack of depth and and how I think as you said um, that um, common sense psychology is is a hoax. Right? I mean, it's <laughs> extreme language, but I, I really loved it. <laughs> um, and so in that sense, it was a little bit uh, disheartening. But then, of course, uh, towards the end. Uh, you start making some really amazing uh, kind of speculations. Uh, one of which I found fascinating was this idea that psychologists could probably uh, learn a lot from uh, literature and the arts mm. uh, and uh, maybe a little bit less from from the sciences uh, going forward. Uh, but let, let's start with this really profound uh, claim that you make, mm. that there is no inner world of thought from which our thoughts issue. Now, this would kind mm. of say that the entire psychology yeah. industry, which is trying and, and, you know, a amateur and professional, which is all about teasing out, um, you know, our inner identities, our inner selves, our unconscious, the, the deep foundations of who we are, that this is sort of a, a waste of our time. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I wouldn't put it quite as far as to say it's a waste of our time. So we should come back to that. Because um, I think there's something extremely valuable going on when one's thinking, who am I? What am I really about? What are my goals? What are my objectives? I think that's a really valuable and important thing. And I think you know, helping having other people help you with that in therapy or in you know in conversation, that's you know, one of the most important things that we do. But it, what I think is not going on is that we're not probing through those processes, either of introspection or through talking to other people. We're not probing our minds to say, what's in there really? You know, like what is what what is in my brain? You know, it's not that you're able to somehow um, hunt about. Uh, in your sort of in in a in a life and and find sort of fleeting um, scraps which tell you what you're really really like. I think that's a really fundamental mistake. And there's a, just a different kind of metaphor. I think we want we should have in our, our um, thinking about this. And that's the idea of continual improvisation. Um, so I mean, when I'm yeah when we when we're conversing. Um, the, the the process by which I generate my next stream of, of words and 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 you do too, is something that we have no real understanding of. I mean, we don't we can't explain when why why are these words coming to mind? Why are not those other words? They just they just burble out, and in, remarkably, most of the time we make reasonable sense, but we don't make perfect sense, of course. And we ought to make per- we don't don't make perfect sense because we are improvising. So if you imagine. If we if we were really um, viewing a, a sort of a uh, as, as it were a true uh, inner landscape, you know, I have a stable set of beliefs, I have a stable set of values, a stable set of plans, and all of this is is pretty fixed. Then at least ideally, when you ask me questions, any questions, I should be able to, be able to say, well, let me let me look up look that up in my inner database, and I'll just tell you the answer. And if you ask me a similar question, related question, or the same question again, it should all fit together. It'd be a bit like you know having a perfect map. And if, if if you ask me, you know, where's one city in relation to another city, and where's this, this that other city again, and you know, how does that relate to the coast? You can ask me any questions, and all the answers will fit together if I've got a perfect map. But of course, we don't have that kind of equivalent to the map. When I, when you're asking me about um, what I think about this issue or that issue, or what my plans are for next year and what my plans are for next week, and all of these things, um, I will give you a set of answers, but I'm making them up at the moment you're asking me them. And because I'm doing that, they will tend to be inconsistent with each other. So it's like I'm, a, I'm more like a fiction writer. This goes back to, your, to the connection you mentioned earlier with the arts. It's more like I'm a, a creative fiction writer thinking, well, you asked me a question there, and I've got to give a sensible answer. Well, let me try this one. And I'm trying to be consistent with the thing this character, me, has said before. I don't want to just wander off in some completely random tangent. Of course I don't, because I, you've got to hold me to account. When, you, when I say something, and I say, oh, I'm planning to do this, and I don't do it. And you say, well, well you said you'd do it, and I didn't. And So I, I, I know I'm not completely unconstrained, but I'm... I'm, I'm I'm improvising my answers. Now you might ask yourself, well, why should you know, why why should we see it that way? Why should we see ourselves as these these sort of continual um, improv- generating this continual stream of improvisation? And of course, that's really what the book, at least the first half of the book, is about: is providing that story. Um, but I think the sort of essence, the essential point, really, is this is this lack of 
lack of consistency. Um, it's the sort of the fact that if you, if you ask me different questions in different ways on different days or even different moments, I'll just give you different answers. Um, so a, a lovely example, which is a, a, a comes from the work of um, there are many, but let me pick, pick one up from the work of Eldar Shafir, who's a Princeton um, psychologist, very a uh, very good one. Um, he has this lovely phenomenon that he discovered in the nineties, um, where you ask people, you give you give people two options. And one mm -hmm. is a really middle of the road option. It doesn't matter what the option is, what it's about. It could be custody decisions, one of the things he does. It could be um, monetary gambles. It could be holiday choices. It doesn't make any difference. But anyway, you've got this one option and it's got, it's got all the features it has are all very middling. And then you have another option, which has some really good features and some bad features. So the example I like to give with, with holidays is you've got some fairly dull holiday, which is pretty cheap and it's not a very exciting resort, but it's kind of nearby and it's kind of easy. And there's this really glamorous holiday in an exciting place, but it's so expensive you can barely afford it. So that's one example, right? So you've got this kind of extreme option, extreme good stuff, extreme bad stuff, and you've got this sort of middle of the road option. And then on the one hand, so the first thought you'd have is, well, of course, if you give me any two options, I should have a preference. I mean, maybe I, maybe they're exactly equal, but probably I have a preference one way or the other. But it turns out, and this is the, the miracle of the Shafir uh, trick, is he's, that, that if you ask me a qu the question in a different way, you'll get me to, get, get, get me to give you a different answer, mm -hmm. or at least on balance across you know, numbers of subjects. So, and crucially, so the first version, you say, here's a middling holiday, uh, say, and here's a holiday which has got very many exciting features, but some real downsides. Maybe you hate long-haul flights. Maybe long-haul flights are bad for the environment, which they surely are. So there's some bad stuff, but there's some good stuff. So which would you prefer? Which you, you've got to choose one. And on balance, so let's say, and this is you know, we true in when, when the experiments, experiments are carefully designed and carried out, that most people on the whole choose the the expensive, ho the um, exciting holiday, but with the downsides, the extreme option. Now, the other condition, the other variation that the other half of the participants get is a case where you say, you've got these two holidays, but you can only choose one. You've got to reject one. So which one are you going to reject? And this is the shocking thing that they also reject. The majority of people reject the very same holiday. So they say, well, the extreme one, no, I better reject that. Now that doesn't, yeah, it seems like, how could that be? How could that make any sense? I mean, you, if you had an underlying preference, surely if you ask me, um, essentially the same question the other way around it. I'm just going to give you, you know, the consistent answer, but I don't. And the really interesting thing is, is, um, is Eldar's explanation, which I think is incredibly, um, deep really. Um, the explanation is, look, you've asked me to justify and come up with a reason to choose one of two holidays. So I'm thinking in a positive mood, a positive frame. I'm thinking I've got to have a reason to do choose something. So I must think of a good feature of that thing. Ah, I know, mm -hmm. this exciting holiday in a glamorous location, it's got loads of good features. So if you're asking me to choose something, that's what I'll do. And in fact, if you then want me to justify my decision, I'll say, well, look, you know, those wonderful, you know, wonderful um, culture and beaches and whatever it is. So I can tell you all this stuff about why it's a really good choice. And also, importantly, I can tell myself that too. On the other hand, if you say, which of these holidays would you like to reject? Now my little mind beats, be, run, rushes off thinking, I've got to improvise a reason to reject something. Mm -hmm. Well, luckily, that long haul flight slash you know, way, way too expensive holiday, I mean, I can reject that. I mean, I can't afford that. That's totally insane. Well, I hate long haul flights. So I can reject it really easily. So the thing is that that is, that is the improvisational mind in action. So you've, I've, I've, I'm facing a question. I've got to cook up an answer. One of those options has really obvious downsides and upsides. If you ask me which, what to choose, I focus on the upside and I choose it. If you ask me what not to choose, I focus on the downsides and luckily it's got lots of those, so I, can, I choose it again. Um, and that makes perfect sense from this improvisational point of view, but it doesn't really make sense if I had a kind of, as it were, a, a kind of, a, a kind of uh, scales in my head weighing up you know, all the things I liked with, with numbers or something. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think the, 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 the Shafir story that you tell it's, it's a little bit different than most of the stories that you tell, because right? most of the stories that you tell, what happens is, you know, there's perception or action, and then mm. afterwards you have to impose some interpretation, right? But, but here's an example where, you know, you're, you're, you're told the interpretation that you need, and then you take the action to try and be consistent with, with the in interpretation. And, and so, so this is, you know, th is this about, mm. you know, the, the human, the, you know, part of our, um, our folk wisdom or our folk psychology is that, you know, we are consistent. And, and so, uh, and so we look for consistencies among the inconsistencies mm. in our past, but then we also try to take actions because you know, we have in front of us some, some interpretation that we're trying to, to live up to is that, 
Is that the idea? Yeah. I mean, I think that the desire for consistency is very real. The, the illusion is thinking, I must be consistent because it, uh, there's this inner world. Mm -hmm. and, and like the real world is consistent, isn't it? I mean, if it's the case that, that I mean, you can wonder, you know, is, is London north of New York or South Island? I'm not too sure. But, but it's one or the other, right? And it's mm -hmm. consistent. You, it's not that London, if London is north of New York, New York, but London is also south of New York. That's not possible. Because um, the world is consistent. The, the external world is consistent. And the illusion we have is, well, the inner world, it's a world after all. It must be consistent too. It's not. So, so, so then the intuition we have is that um, any inconsistencies I come up with must be some kind of reading, reading error. Mm -hmm. I'm looking in my mind, I'm making a few mistakes. Um, and that, of course, that's the way psychologists have normally seen it. Because when you give people any task at all, um, it can be about mental images, it can be about... Um, it can be about, be about the kind of thing we just talked about, about choices, it can be about beliefs, just, just anything. They, a stream of inconsistent stuff emerges. Um, and we all kind of know we're doing it. We think, ah, oh, I said that, but now, hang on, I've just said this, this is a bit weird. Um, so the normal story is, well, of course, the inner world is a, is, it's a world, so it must be consistent, and I just can't see it very clearly. It's kind of a murky thing. And I want to say, no, that's completely the wrong perspective. It's a bit like, it's, it's much more like a story. Right. So it's like if you're writing a story and somebody says, oh, um, you know, what happens next? Um, the answer is, well, I haven't figured that out yet. I'm still writing it. Um, and it, you, know, it, you might say, oh, but the thing you told me now doesn't seem to fit with what you said before. And to which I, if, I, if that happens, I think as a writer, I think, oh, no, you're right. I, I better change that. Or I didn't spot that, you know, that inconsistency. So I'm trying all the time to be consistent. Mm -hmm. But, it, but because, I'm, because I'm making up this story, I'm going to fail. Um, I, haven't got, I haven't got some sort of inner map or inner kind of database to, to consult. Well, when you start the book, you, you, you talk about a fictional character, right? So you talk about Anna mm. Karenina and, and you talk yeah. about how, you know, when you're, as you go through the process of reading the novel, you know, you're trying, you're, you're trying to back out, right? You're trying to infer some, some common, you know, personality or, or, you know, some identity, or, you know, you're crafting this character in your mind. And, and so you're trying to kind of reverse engineer that character from the mm. discrete uh, factoids that you learn about mm. the person. And, and you, you say that, well, you know, it doesn't matter whether this was a journalist or a novelist, you, you'd have to be doing yeah. the sort of same sort of exercise. Um, yeah. and when you're thinking about yourself, presumably, you know, you have to do the same exercise. You just, you just yeah. are less, a little bit less conscious of it. I know when people ask yeah. me, they say, well, you know, why did you do this? Um, you know, why did you do that? Why, why, why did you do that yesterday? And, and so my response oftentimes is, well, you know, I have a theory. Right? Mm, and, yes, and that's that's yes. not, that's, you know, mm. the people are like, why, what do you mean you have a theory? Right? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know, but I have, have a theory, but isn't that kind of theorizing necessary for us to make mm. predictions, right? We, we, we <clears throat> try to theorize about other people so that we can kind of craft some expectations about, you know, what they're going to do or, or what, what's going to happen going forward. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's right. So I'm, wouldn't, I'm not saying that, uh, intuitive understanding of each other should be abandoned and um, we just just to see it for what it is and what it is is a uh, is is, is a, a a rough and ready way of trying to predict a sort of intelligent machine very very complex intelligent machine whose workings of which we know nothing um so so if, if i think about watching someone you said else it's like, you said it's like a refrigerator right you say understanding the mind yeah, is like understanding yeah. a refrigerator you know we don't really understand yeah. how it works but we can we kind of know that what it does, and yes, and, and that's right. Predict it yeah. exactly. Yes, and I mean it, it, these things like refrigeration are things that we all kind of feel. We sure must have learned it at school, and we must kind of understand it. I mean, if you spend any, if, unless of course you happen to be trained in these things, um, if you spend any time thinking, well, how on earth is it that that you can get some cold, you can get something that's cold to be even colder? And I mean, how weird is that? And what's going on? I mean, none, you know, essentially, none of us have a clue. Um, and I think that. And there's lots of lovely exper uh, experiments, studies in psychology where um, you try to get people to explain their intuitive understanding of electricity or um, yeah. they have refrigerators or air conditioners or whatever it is. And, and, and people usually start, as we all do, fairly, fairly confidently, but things sort of crash and burn very rapidly because um, we don't really understand. And I think our own minds are just like that. Um, so you kind of think, well, minds, I mean, you know, I am, I am a mind. I mean, surely I must know how this works. But as mm -hmm. soon as you start to contemplate what's going on it kind of becomes increasingly baffling um so and i think the key point really is that we don't have any special knowledge of ourselves um so if i'm watching a, a, a movie or reading a book i have a sort of sense of well these things this person's done these things before and that, that, that ran through their mind according to the author so maybe this is what we're going to think next so how they're going to react in this situation i've got some ideas but i i didn't really know for sure and 
And of course, that will be true if it's a real person I'm watching in a, you know, in a, in a real um, encounter. But it's also true of myself. Um, you know, I, I have some guidelines, I have some expectations about how, how I'm going to behave and how I'm going to feel, but I don't really know. And going back to the, the point that um, we're improvisers, you know, I'm, it's, a kind of, it's kind of impossible to know because I'm literally, you know, it's, I'm inventing it now. Um, so I, you know, I hadn't made it up before. And so to know what I was going to do would be to sort of do all the thinking of one's entire life and, 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 and sort of do it up front. I mean, the thing is, as an improviser, the, the brain's job moment by moment is to, is to do this incredible job of, of, of creating explanations and understanding. Um, but it, you know, it, it hasn't, hasn't got it prepackaged. Right. So I think the, the core of your story is about this narrow channel of, yeah. of consciousness, which, which is sort of built on this narrow channel of perception, yes, right? Absolutely. And the idea is that, you know, you can only sort of see one thing at a time or think mm. about one thing at a time. And, and, and so this, the story of optical flow, um, mm. you know, maybe you could, you could walk through it a bit and kind of how we kind of create this illusion, because I yeah. think what, what really brought it home to me was when you, you mapped it on over into the world of memory, right? And you ask someone to kind of, th you know, imagine something or, or remember something and, and the process by which we remember it is, is, is very similar, right? You know, yeah. where we have to kind of, you know, move our, 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 um, you know, imaginary eye around mm. to the various parts of the, of the object and, and try to, you know, figure out what's going on. Yes. Yes. So I think the, the, the first part of the story is this really remarkable fact that, um, uh, the, the channel from which we see, we see the world and indeed same for other senses is incredibly far, far narrower than we think. Um, so we sort of half know this because we were all taught very early on in biology lessons that the, um, the, 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 the cells in the eye are very concentrated in the center. Mm -hmm. um, so in the center of the retina, there's a big clump in the fovea where, where, where the density of the cells allows us to perceive fine detail. And also that's where almost all the color vision is. So essentially all, all the cone cells, there are two types of cells, of course, the cone cells for color and the, um, the rod cells for black and white. I mean, that's crude, but it's roughly the story. And the cone cells are pretty much all in the fovea and a little bit surrounding the fovea. They kind of taper off to about 10 degrees of visual angle. But their color vision is good within about one degree of visual angle and gets weaker beyond that. But of course, so that would, just looking at the anatomy of the eye, you'd think, ah, oh, well, one thing we can be sure of is that there'll be no color vision in the periphery. I, mean, like, like I look around the room, mm -hmm. I think, well, of course, everything's pretty black and white in the edge, at the edges, and there's a lovely pu pu pure color in the middle, of what, what, right where I'm looking. And similarly for detail. So I should have a real sense there's a detailed, precise world uh, right where I'm looking, but everything else is very woolly. Um, and and that is how we think it is. But sorry, that's not how we think it is. I mean, intuitively, we think, well, that's wrong, isn't it? I mean, everything's in sharp focus and everything's colorful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, how can this be? What's going on? One possibility, of course, would be that somehow the anatomy is misleading us. Um, but clever experiments of many different kinds um, show that that's not right, not the case. In fact, the anatomy is not misleading. In fact, we probably have an even narrower bottleneck than we think. So a lovely, probably the most convincing example, I think, or the one, perhaps the example that staggered me the most when I heard it, I, yeah, I just... Yeah, it's, just, it's, just, it's just extraordinary. Is the um, is the phenomenon that Keith Rayner and colleagues discovered at, at the University of Massachusetts in about the early, very early seventies. So they got people to read texts with um, with what's called a gaze contingent eye tracking. This is um, a mechanism, a me method where you track the position of somebody's eye, and you can change what's on the computer screen in front of them depending on what's where their eye's moving. And this is pretty pretty impressive stuff in the early seventies. So. The trick is that they, deci they, they decided to make sure that you could have proper letters where you were looking, but everywhere else, in fact, out, you have 15 characters, actually, five backwards of where you're looking, five to the left, the 10 to the right. Everywhere else was just X's. So you're reading a sentence, and if someone just looked at that sentence and could move their eyes around freely, uh, with that, and they were, as it were, looking over your shoulder, they think, well, that's a lot of X's. There's just a few letters there. But the letters are where you're looking. So you move, you, as you read the sentence, wherever you, your eye moves in these little discrete hops, saccades, and as it hops, letters appear, and then you hop again, and letters appear, and let, hop, hop again, and letters appear. Um, and the weird thing is that when you have, you're in these conditions, when you're in, in the experiment, you, you just think you're reading normally. 
So if, if someone said, well, what are all those X's doing? You'd say, well, what X's? I don't see any X's. I'm just reading a normal sentence. If you, and if you ask the person, can you see lots of words on the screen? Oh yeah, I can see lots of words. Um, it's just like, well, what, you know, what's the problem? Well, the problem is it's almost all X's. You can only, the only letters, mm -hmm. which aren't X's or Latin or anything you like, there's the only letters that are actually meaningful are the ones right where your eye is. Now that's a really, really strange phenomenon. So what it's telling you, I think, is that the intuition that we have that the world is is a rich, solid um, place that we're perceiving as loaded into our mind is is a mistake. I mean, the world is rich and solid and colourful and so on, but we haven't loaded it into our mind. It's not in our we're in our mind's eye. But what is the case is that we have the correct sense that any time I want to answer a question about how the world is, I can answer it. So. Um, and that sense, so, so essentially the, the, the trick is that if I think to myself, is the world you know, fully detailed and colorful? Well, I'll check and I'll check by thinking, well, what's that word over there? Mm -hmm. As soon as I think, check, my eye flicks over and looks at it, gives me the answer. Oh, okay. I, you know, I could see that one, couldn't I? And then you say, oh, what's the color of that book on your shelf? And I think, oh, it's, it's orange. Now I can answer that because I'm looking at it, right? As soon as you ask me to look at it, I look at it and I can tell you the answer. So I think, but it's so quick, right? It's so fluent, so fast that I have the feeling, well, I kind of knew that, didn't I? I mean, it was in my head already. I'd, I'd loaded it into my brain. So I have the, because, so, so that sense of the, of, of being in sort of perceptual, rich perceptual contact with the entire environment. I don't think it's really an illusion. It's just that what it's telling us is that we can answer whatever question we want to answer. Ask me a question about color of anything, I can so, answer it, but but I, do, I don't have that loaded in my brain, as it were. So when people read faster, point. let's say, it's not that their perceptual window is bigger, it's just that they're able to no. you know, move faster and process uh, the, the information better. Um, yeah. Yeah, but what about uh, people, you know, we talk about people developing a better kind of sense of, of peripheral vision. Um, you know, are they people that are, you know, scanning the environment more uh, aggressively uh, or are they people who sort of have um, a, a better capacity to remember or infer kind of what, what, uh, what they're not actually focused on? Yeah, that's a good question. So to, to pick on, on the reading point quickly, um, so roughly speaking, when you're reading, you're, you're not quite reading one word at a time, but you're pretty close. Mm -hmm. So short words you jump over, really long ones you might do two hops. Of course, sometimes you go backwards. But it's not far from one word at a time as an approximation. And people who are quick readers, um, they do move faster, but they also jump more. Mm -hmm. um, so they're just better at inferring, well, I saw the beginning of that word, I guess the rest of it must have been this, and probably there'll be, there'll be an in and a the afterwards. And so the gaps, you know, a lot of the stuff is predictable, right? If you, if you covered up some of the text, you could figure out well, given the, the, the words I, to each side, that gap must be filled in like this. And people who are good readers are good at, do it, good at doing that kind of filling in. Um, and people who are a, a supposed, but well, the supposed phenomenon of speed reading, where you're supposedly be able, supposed to be able to read a page in like a couple of seconds or something, I mean, that just turns out to be totally bogus and just doesn't work at all. So if you, you and I, I remember trying this as a teenager and I, you know, I had a go at you know, trying to read. Tolstoy or something at tremendous speed and I sort of tried this for about 30 minutes and I thought I'm, this is really good I, I I know there's something something about balls is happening and, and there's some, some sort of battle and it's like well yes and then you in retrospect I think well of course if you've just taken a random you know, random word salad out of yeah. um, you know, whatever it was War and Peace then yep that's you know you're going to know that of course you've got no real clue what's going on um, so to some extent reading quickly is you know we, 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 we can fool ourselves when we're reading quickly that the information's all piling in, but it isn't. Um, it, but it's, but on this question of peripheral peripheral vision, I think the, um, the, 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 the thing that you have aside from this narrow window in the visual system, you do have um, a system, a, a, this very large set of detectors, the, these rod cells, which are mostly interested in change. So what mm -hmm. they really care about is, 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 is something surprising happening. And the reason they're there is because they, uh, they're telling the, the favea where to look. So it's as if you've got this kind of super powered searchlight and you can look, look anywhere with it, but you can only look at one thing at a time and you need something in the system to say something going on here. You should look. Um, so it's things like, you know, f sudden movements, change contrasts. Uh, those are the things that will pull the just pull, pull the, um, uh, the, the spotlight onto the right place. So I'm sure people vary a lot in how, how sensitive they are, how quick they are, how good they are at using that. Uh, but we're all using that system all the time, of course, but, mm. but, they, but, but that's, that's a sort of separate thing, but that system doesn't know what anything is. 
It doesn't. He doesn't. It doesn't say. Oh, ignore that fast-moving object because that was just a. You know, yeah. That's just a fly. But look at this one because it's that's a you know, an enemy plane or something. You know, it doesn't have any of that sophistication. But truly, you learn over time kind of what constitutes novelty and and what doesn't. You know what sort of things you can ignore. I mean, you think about uh, you know really high professional level athletes and and how they're able to you know know what what they're supposed to notice and what they're not supposed to notice, right? Because the isn't this sort of about accumulating a, a set of patterns, right? So you mentioned the chess players, right? And they can yes. uh, size up a, a, a chess board in a, in, a, in a few seconds, right? They're, they're clearly not going through uh, piece by piece by piece by no. piece, right? Um, no, and similarly, right. when, you, when, you, right. when you talk about those, those, you say, you know, you actually use these images where you had like a, the head of a dog and, and you rotate it. And, mm. and you know, that, that means that the definition of a thing, if you can only look at one thing yeah. at a time, the definition of a thing can expand or, yeah, or you know, a, a word can become a pattern of words or something yes. like that, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, of course, when you first learn to read as a child, um, a letter is a thing. In fact, it may not even be a thing. I mean, it's, it's a challenge to turn a, yeah. a squiggle rather than just being some key, some strokes. It's a, you know, to turn it into a, a G or an I or whatever. And, of course, as we get very f to be fluent readers words are roughly things um and so yeah you're absolutely right and so with a ch chess player um yes highly experienced chess players do start to see at least parts of the board as, as things um so they're able to appraise probably not the entire board but large chunks of it i oh, have yeah, this yeah, this yeah, i've seen this formation a million times and this is basically what's going on mm -hmm. here's a, here's another f old favorite over this part of the board um and this phenomenon which is you know people like herbert simon um, uh, dis discuss a lot in the 60s and 70s and 80s, this idea of chunking. So you're creating, and George Miller, going back to George Miller, for the great, great cognitive, founders of cognitive psychology, this idea that you, as you become more skilled at something, you start to re-represent the world. So rather than representing it as a lot of little pieces, you start to create these new, bigger pieces. So yeah, that's a critical, critical thing, yeah. And I think people who are extremely experienced musicians or sports people, uh, or indeed linguists, um, they are creating these new representations um, all the time. Um, of course, when you're learning a foreign language, it's like that too. I mean, the, it starts off as just a blur of sound, and then gradually you sort of hear little little fragments you understand, and gradually you hear a bit more. I've never got that far, but but if, yeah, if the this process of creating sort of ever larger units. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. The, I think there is a pretty pretty solid principle. It's not you know you, some psychologists would argue that's not. It might be a bit too restrictive, but I'm going to hold to it for now anyway and say that there's a pretty good principle that you can only perceive one thing at a time. But as you say, what counts as a thing is a flexible, it's flexible. And as you learn, as you become more expert, the, the, that, that, that is a malleable notion. The thing becomes richer and bigger. Yeah. So like, you know, many other uh, people who teach kind of judgment, decision making and so forth, I, you know, I, I use the, um, can of, the Kahneman framework, right? Mm. Where you have the system one, system two. And, yes. and you know, one, of, one of the key distinctions in, in that literature is that system one, you can do kind of uh, parallel processing mm. and, and system two, you know, it's kind of serial processing. But, but I think, you know, you're, you're kind of saying, well, even when it appears to be kind of parallel processing there's 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 quite a bit of serial processing going on it's just sort of happening very very quickly is that the idea uh yes i think that's right i mean there are the the, the, the parallel serial distinction is a very subtle one isn't it because the, the so for example if you're thinking about um perceiving um an object so you look at us look look at some company or something in, in a sense you've got to search your memory in parallel because you don't know is this a dog is it a you know, is, it, is it a yeah a, a, a car? Is it a, a you know a, 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 I don't know a, a, a painting? I mean, because it could be so many things, and you've got to search all the things this this object could be, and you've got to search them really fast. And if, of course, in a complex moving scene, you know, these things things are only really going to be present for a short period, and you may have to interact with it. So you you need to be fast. So you don't want to be slowly thinking. Well, let me just check. It's, is it this? Is it this? As it were, you were kind of going through a, a sort of a, 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 a set of templates one by one. So there, you know, the ability to search memory in parallel is truly staggering. Actually, I mean, the fact that we're able to see um, you know, an object and recognize it within a, you know, two or three hundred milliseconds, even let, possibly less for very familiar objects, oh, it's like an amazing thing. So we're doing really rich parallel search. Well, another example would be faces. I mean, you see somebody uh, that you know, you know who they are within two or three hundred milliseconds um and that obviously is another parallel search you can't be searching your database of friends and acquaintances one by one but on the other hand you can only do that such parallel search once you can't search if i show you two faces 
you can't say, oh, I've recognized them both at once. You can recognize one face and then think, mm -hmm. then you have to think, let me now check the other one. And <clears throat> you can't do two. And I think this is, this is not unconnected because when you're doing this parallel search, you're taking up basically a lot of resources I and mean, you're just looking mm -hmm. everywhere. It's in one, you're basically sending out a broadcast signal to the brain saying, have you seen this? Um, and if you do that twice it's at the same time, you're just going to get horrible interference. I mean, it just appears to be the case that the brain just can't really do that. So this, so the process is in one sense uh, parallel because you're searching this huge database or you're searching, you're not searching the searching them entry by entry, you're searching them all at once. But it's serial in the sense you can't search for more than one thing. Um, so for example, we um, we did an experiment, this was by a couple of colleagues at Warwick, Greg Jones and Elizabeth, Elizabeth Mailer, um, probably I don't know, 12 or 13 years ago now. We did a very, very simple experiment to look at this where we asked people to generate as many of whatever category we, we like, but say as many cities, UK cities or US cities, or could be types of animal or whatever you like. You generate as many as you can. So you know, people, st and you just write them down. And we just look at how quickly they write them, they write them down. Um, so the simple version is you, you just, you just have one category and off you go. Um, and then you do another category, then you do another category. Um, and then the mo slightly more complex version is you say, well, you know, if you like, you can give us either, uh, an animal or a US city. I mean, it doesn't matter which weather. So the, the dream would be that if you could search, search both of these at once, then of course you, you do a few US cities and then you think, oh, I'm kind of like, if, if you're, if you're American, it'll be easy. You'll be going for a long time, but I, I might be struggling after a, you know, a couple of minutes of this, I'll be thinking, oh, it's, it's getting harder and harder, but luckily I can put in some animals. If I could search the animals and the cities mm -hmm. at the same time, then I should be do much better at this task than if I had to do mm -hmm. just cities and animals, because I can run them both in parallel. And when, when one search fails, the other one's still going, but you don't see that at all. Mm -hmm. So people completely switch. They do cities, animals, cities, animals, and how quick they are is exactly predicted by essentially how long they're thinking about one task or the other task. There's no parallelism at all. So it's really interesting that even something as simple as just thinking, you know, let me think of animals, um, that's, that blocks out you know, all other memory searches. You, you can't search your memory twice you know, in, in two ways at once. Um, but you make the point also that if you, you know, uh, stop doing a task and then revisit it later, you know, you can see bursts in, in, uh, kind of creativity yes. or, you know, uh, better results, but that's usually, that's not because you're, you're, you're kind of, you know, your brain is working yeah. on it in the interim. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's because, you know, you're just taking a fresh approach yes. and yes. this happens all the time with crossword puzzles, yeah. right? You know, work on a crossword puzzle, hit a dead end. And then, um, you know, sometimes even if, if I have someone read the question out loud to me, um, you know, instead of me reading it over and over again, it may trigger mm. something, but, but this is, this is a very different phenomenon, right? This, yeah. This is sort of getting out of that, that dead end trap of, of absolutely. Of cyclical yeah. Thinking. Yeah. I mean, this is, a, this is a long term, long, long standing debate in, um, psychology of problem solving. And I mean, one, you know, my sort of view is with the, with the more deflationary, less exciting story, which I think is the right story, which is exactly as you say, that you get stuck in dead ends and you need help to get out of them. And your, your example is very interesting, actually. So just asking the question in a different way, presenting the information in a different way, that may be enough to get the brain, not just to go back to where you were before and just tell you that again, it's, it does something, it's up something new, but getting stuck in a, you know, in a, in a local minimum in a rut, that is a, that is our sort of bane of our lives. Um, so. Yes, and if you, in general, um, if you get people to do a, a set of problems and they get stuck on some of them, and then you ask them again to start again tomorrow, they, they don't really. They, there's no sign that they've, they've 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 been doing secret processing. They don't turn up and say, "Oh well, you know, now I look at these, I can just rattle them off because I've solved all these last night when I was asleep, or you know, I was working on these for hours." I mean, that's just not the case. You suddenly, but you do. But, but they always say this. They always they always say you should sleep on a big decision, yeah. right? Well, I think there is. I think there is validity for because of the the rut. To getting stuck in ruts point. I think this is really valid advice mm -hmm. um, because I think coming at, coming back to a problem, you may see it from a different point of view. Um, so one thing I'm very, very keen on is the, the fact that we don't really, we're not really aware of how stuck we get. So we see a problem, and this is the kind of reason that insight problems are such fun, is that you have a, some, you have some problem and you think, oh, it's just impossible. I couldn't possibly, have, you know, it doesn't make any sense. What could the solution be? Mm. And then, you know, someone says, ah, yeah, but look at it like this. And you think, oh God, yeah, of course I see, I get it. So suddenly, it, you know, suddenly you see the answer. Um, and I think that, and, and that's that, but, but, but of course, until you've seen it the other way, you, it's not that you saw it the other way and thought that's a silly way. You just haven't seen it that way at all. So it's like, it's like the classic 
duck rabbit, which I'm very fond of, that you see this thing which is half duck, you know, looks like a duck, but it kind of looks like a rabbit. But you you don't think that's a, a rabbit looking like a duck or a duck looking like a rabbit. You think that's a duck, and then you think, oh, but maybe it's a rabbit. Or is this also a rabbit? Oh, it's a duck. Also a rabbit. But you only see one of those interpretations at a time. And unless you knew there were two interpretations, you probably never even noticed the other one. Actually, um, mm-hmm. I think that's true for us in in daily life. So, yeah, if you if you see some, if you look at a problem in a particular way, and you think, well, the obvious thing to do is this. I see. I know what this kind of problem is. It's just like that problem I had before. And that's what I'm going to do. Then, yeah, you, you, the, the fact, the possibility that you're misunderstanding the problem, and in fact, there's some other way of thinking about it, and you haven't thought that through, is not really going to occur to you. You, you see it as a duck, and you behave in a duck-like way. On the other hand, if you woke up tomorrow and looked at the problem again, you might think, "Hang on, that looks like a rabbit," because you're not in that rut now, and that might be a really valuable, the really valuable thing. Yeah, I want to get back to that interpretation uh, part, but um, you know, before we move on from the this this idea of serial versus parallel, um, I remember I took an art history class, um, and it was about Picasso and Picasso was painting around the time that Saussure was, was writing. And, and the instructor uh, said that, you know, um, a lot of people believe that, um, you know, a language was something that had to be experienced, uh, you know, serially, whereas the visual experience could be done in parallel. And then his, his point was that Picasso exploded that a bit by, you know, uh, illustrating how, you know, when we take in visual information, we, you know, we, we do so also mm. in, in kind of a, um, a sequentially way, a sequential way and kind of made this explicit in, in, in his, his painting. Um, but I was wondering if you could comment on the, 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 the memory task, which I, I, I really mm. enjoyed that memory task where you asked, uh, someone to imagine a tiger or imagine yes, a, uh, yes. kind of a cube and, and rotate that cube mm. in, in, mm. in space. And, yeah, you know, yeah. initially I was like, oh, this is going to be easy, but it's actually, you know, quite hard. Yeah. 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 I think these are very interesting. Um, so the, the, probably the easiest one to, to talk about is the, the tiger. Um, so you, you just ask yourself, um, but it's a very simple thing, which is goes back to a nice, I uh, talk discuss, discussion by Zenon Polition in the seventies, uh, which is you know, how many stripes on a tiger's tail. And you kind of think, well, I imagine a tiger, I'm imagining it now, try to count those stripes. And as soon as you start to count them, you think, well, I, yeah, I can't really see them. And I keep sort of moving around. Um, and <laughs> this is all very odd. Um, and so that's, that's weird in itself because going back to our improvisation point, um, the, if you can, if you can improvise, you can't improvise a picture of a, a detailed mm. picture of a tiger. It's just too hard. I and mean, you can't, you can't, you can't perceive a. If you can perceive a whole tiger, because you're perceiving the whole tiger, you're not perceive, perceiving all its mm-hmm. um, sort of components, as it were. So if you're conceiving the whole tiger, you're not conceiving it. You're not um, perceiving its uh, its tail as a, as an entity, and you're not perceiving its toenails as an entity, and so on. So you you you, you have to be pick on pick pick your level. But that also that, that point about perception, of course, applies to images too. So if I'm thinking of the whole tiger, I'm, having a sense of the general shape of the thing how maybe how it moves. Um, but if you say, but I'm not focusing on any individual part of it. As soon as I focus on the individual part, then, um, I have to create that part in more detail. So before I focus on the tiger's tail, I, it hasn't got a number of stripes because I haven't actually created it. If you force me to create it, I probably won't even create the stripes either. I'll just create some generic stripey, stripey thing. If you get me to count them, then my brain's got to think, oh God, I've got to create some actual stripes. Um, but I'm, but it's hard to do, but also they're not, they're not there already. I, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I have the sense of a vivid image, but the vivid image is vivid because as I want to, to uh, zoom in on a bit of it or query a bit of it, I can create that, but I'm, I'm creating it in the moment. It's not, it's not already there. And, and our images aren't really as vivid as we think. So that's the, 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 the tiger kind of illustrates that. Um, but another thing that's nice about tigers is the, is that if you ask yourself, well, the front of the tiger, I mean, how do the, how do the stripes, the how do they go around the, up the legs? So you kind of imagine the stripes going up the legs. Oh, that's a bit weird. I don't quite know how they get up the legs. And then they get to the body. And so the stripes, how, how do they go? How do the body and the legs attach? And how do the stripes kind of flow from one to the next? And then, and what about the front of the tiger? And what does that, how does that look? Um, and it, it's all just a total mystery. And when you think about it, um, and of course, in fact, it turns out that, that tigers don't have stripes on their front at all, uh, which most of us are, you know, if you know a lot about tigers, you'd know this, but, um, but most of us have no idea. And you look at a tiger and you think, oh yeah, right. Of course, that looks looks like a tiger should look, but you can't see any of this um, in your mind's eye because your mind's eye is just a much a much woollier thing than you think. But also, it's it so it, it, it gives you the sense of vividness, which is you know, to a large extent an illusion. Um, but I think the most important point is that the mind's eye is not it's not as it, it's it, it, the whole idea of the mind's eye is a tremendous sort of 
it is a hoax, really. It, it's the, the, it gives us the sense that instead of looking out at tigers me, you know, meandering across the jungle floor, I can also look at tigers in my mental landscape. And mm. There they are, sort of wandering around in my sort of you know, inner world. But that's completely wrong. If, they, if that were true, they would have def, you know, definitive numbers of stripes on their tails. And, um, but they don't. Um, they, you know, I, I, it's, it's, I, I can only envisage a, you know, a, one object at a time, one piece of an object at a time. Um, and I'm very bad at doing that. Um, so yeah, so I think this is, a, this is a, also a nice analogy for thinking about our own beliefs and our preferences and our plans and our principles. Um, so with the tiger, we think, well, um, I've got this inner tiger in my head. I must just describe it. But then we discover, well, actually, maybe I didn't have a, maybe I didn't have an inner tiger in my head. And I think the same story is if you say, you know, what are your sort of underlying moral principles? I mean, it's not that I'm an unprincipled person, but, but I, it's not like there's a list of them. And I just, if only I could do enough analysis on myself or done deep philosophical thinking, I'd find what they were. Um, I'm uh, improvising my sort of moral perspective or my, you know, my plans for my future or my, my beliefs about the world. I'm improvising them just like I'm improvising the tiger. But, but in the, in the same way, I have this sense that it's pretty solid. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I can kind of see the whole thing, but I can't really, it's, it's as incoherent and, sh and shadowy as, uh, as the tiger. And as soon as you probe me more, you realize, God, it's, you know, totally, it's, it's, it's sort of everything collapses. But, but is, this, is there, I mean, presumably if you're, say, a painter and, and you know, you've been in painting tigers for a while, then your ability to, to recall the features is, is, is crisper, yeah. but you're, but you're still going to have to do so in a, in a sequential way. Is Absolutely. That, is that the idea? Yes. Yes. So if, yes, if you, if you spend a lot of time painting tigers and you're obviously totally know how the stripes lie across the legs and which parts of the tiger don't have stripes at all, cause you've really attended to that. Um, but you, you're still going to be have, going to have to reconstruct the tiger in your mind's eye in a sequential way um so yes picasso himself who was obviously the you know, master of these things he was still working in a sequential way like and, I've, and like 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 our, the rest of our brains do so i think the general story with people who have extraordinary skills is that they're they're like they're like the rest of us but they you know they've got the same type of brain they've just been using it in a very special way for a very long time so would that apply also to the inattentional blindness, right? So, yeah. you know, we, we talk a lot about multitasking and, and the yeah. limits on multitasking, but, but, you know, a lot of people think that they can kind of train themselves, right? So yeah. I, I use the, I use the, the video in my class with the, um, you know, the, the basketballs yeah. and the, and the, and the gorilla stuff, yeah, right? like everyone else. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and kind of the point that, that, that I'm making, and I don't know if this is, this is a correct point is that there's, you know, there's a trade off and that the people who see the gorilla in mm -hmm. general are going to, you know, miscount the basketballs yes. and, and vice versa. And so there's, there's a, you know, there's a, you know, you have to pick your poison and figure yeah. out kind of which, which you're going to be uh, better at, but is there, is there a way to kind of push that frontier out so that you can kind of be, be better at both? You, you yeah. mentioned that when you have these different you can somehow, I mean, you, you mentioned that there are people that can do sight reading and, and, uh, and transcription at the same yes, time. I'm yes. always fascinated by, uh, simultaneous translation people. I'm like, how do they do that? Yeah. Like, I don't understand it. And, and you mentioned that it has a lot to do with the, the connectedness, um, the cooperative, the, the coordinated yes. consciousness. Yes. Yes. So, um, I mean, the, I mean, the inattentional blindness, I think is something that is so deep seated that we can't really fix it. So have me as you, you're exactly right that if you're if you're gonna if you're going to count those basketballs you're going to miss what else is going on so you simply can't follow the ball as it goes from person to person accurately mm -hmm. without missing everything else uh, of course if you know there's something suspicious going on then you can probably jump off the basketballs now and again and just try and sort of look around but but essentially um you're going to always be harming your basketball following performance and then i think that really that is, it sounds like you're using that and i really like it and i haven't thought about it this way it's a really interesting metaphor more broadly that if you're trying to pay close attention um to a particular process or a particular way things are done and that may in some context be really important but if you're doing that you're going to miss stuff and if you're trying not to miss other stuff that might be it might be unexpected then you're going to miss some of the meticulous stuff you can't you can't, there's just an inevitable trade off. You can't do both perfectly. And, it's, and that's fine. We just, you know, what's miraculous about a human mind is it's so un unbelievably good at coping with the complex world, even with these limitations. Um, so I think, you know, that, that, that's, that's, that's correct. I'm sorry. There was a second point to, part of your question, which I've intentionally well, blinded myself to. 
Yeah. Well, well you're, so you're mentioning about the, you know, these different networks and, oh, yes. and if, yes. if things are being done by completely different non-overlapping yeah. networks, then you can yes. engage in simultaneous That's kind right. of focus. Absolutely. You... So this is very interesting. So the, the, I think the broad story about the, the, any particular network in the brain is it can only do one thing at a time. And this is, you know, not everyone would agree with this, but this is a, you know, not not a bad first stab anyway. Um, so, for example, in if you're getting if, if you it is experiments where they um, give people overlapping images, so you have two images, or maybe one's a word and one's an image. They're right on top of each other, and one's say blue and one's green or something. Um, then, in principle, you should be able to recognise you know, your brain. Your the retina has got all the information to recognise both, and you're looking at both as well. But you can't do it. You can you know, your brain signal will say. I read that word, haven't got a clue what the picture is. Or I read, I saw the picture, I haven't got a clue what the word is. So basically your brain is, sh is showing an impulse which is implying, I saw that signal, but I didn't see the other one at all. And you can't, I, I mean, you, you can't really, do, you can't do both. Or at least, to the extent you're doing both, you're not really doing either very well. So it goes exactly back to your point. You can have a little... Well, it's like rubbing your head and patting your belly, right? In, yeah. In, in, in yeah. a way. <laughs> yes, yeah. But, of course... Um, exactly as you say, the some tasks just don't necessarily require overlapping networks at all. Now, the thing here, so this would be things like, um, yeah, so boring examples would be clearly the bits of the brain that, that control breathing and heart rate and so on are not particularly de densely connected to, compared to the with, with the ones that are doing say mental arithmetic. So, you know, you can you can you know, if, you're, if you're doing a bit of hard thinking or mental arithmetic or thinking of some other kind, you know, your physiology just keeps on running, and the brain's you know has separate mechan separate systems for those. But it's also but it is also true that if you're thinking really hard, you might find yourself stopping everything else you're doing. So if you're walking, mm -hmm. you find people will if they're really struggling to, to remember something, so they might stop, and it will actually help. Yeah. Uh, and also you'll look, look like walking look, walking and chewing gum, right? You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, so the thing, the thing that's really interesting, I think, is that is firstly that for anything which requires, we think of as requiring concentration. So something like you know, playing the piano or speaking or um, doing some sums, these things tend to require control from fairly central processes. So sort of the frontal lobe part of the brain, which is helping you decide you know, what to do, what to, when to stop doing that thing, when to. You know, when to move from one part of the task to the next. So basically sort of controlling the process, but the flow of control where you're, you're doing a task. Those the, the complicated processes tend to require a lot of that. And because of that, that is a single network, a single big complicated network. If you're doing one touch task, you can't do another one. Um, so if, you're, if you are you know, playing a, uh, something tricky on a piano, which you can't really do very well, um, and someone says, you know, do some mental arithmetic, you, that's, you, know, you just can't do it. However, if you're um, if if you're doing a task which you're very very familiar with, so you're a very very expert pianist playing a piece that you've played a million times, then all of that um, that, that 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 process does not no, no no longer does need very much frontal control. So essentially, you've you've automated that. That's now you know that can, that can be done without um, by by networks which are just not engaging, not requiring all that uh, frontal control. So you now can do other things. So, for, and you can get touch typists who will be able to um, read. Um, well, they're reading a, a text and typing it, um, and at the same time, they can actually do this extraordinary thing called shadowing, um, so which is where I play no a, 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 a um, uh, pl play a, t a tape of somebody speaking into, into your, one, your ears through headphones, and you just say those words. So you've got this extraordinary thing that the person is doing two totally separate language tasks. One language task is here's a bunch of letters, type them, and here's and the other task is um, here's some words in your ear, speak them, and those two tasks can run simultaneously. Um, now, for mo for most of us, that would be impossible. You just you know just totally garbled. We'd be completely flummoxed and go produce garbled nonsense. But if you're a really good touch typist, then you you can do it. And you've got to be quite a good shadower too, um, it's because you've essentially automated those two processes. They've got separate. They've got separate networks which don't require. Well, basically, you don't want both of them to require the same process, and that's 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 a rare case actually. I mean, the normal the normal story with anything that we require we think of as requiring concentrated effort, almost anything that we do which requires concentration will do in any other thing that requires concentration. We can't can't concentrate on two things at once. In some sense, that's sort of what the concept of concentration is. Um, it's something that's a limited resource. We can only really do one thing at a time. So is, is that because one of those tasks has become, you know, sort of automatic, kind of like yeah. breathing? Like, so if somebody's having a conversation while they're playing tennis, let's say, I mean, is this, is, is this because they are, um, 
you know, just really good at tennis or really good at conversation? Or is it because the parts of the brain, the systems required for tennis are, 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 are you know, in some way uh, different from the parts of the brain required for, for um, you know, for conversation? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I suspect not many people can really play tennis and converse without a bit of interleaving. So they'll, 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 be, not, they'll be speaking when they're not doing the, the, the tricky part of making a shot um, or they're making an easy shot. Um, but yes, I mean, they're clearly going to be aspects of the perceptual motor control aspects of, of tennis playing, and, uh, which aren't, I don't necessarily need to engage with the same processes that require a required in conversation. But anything that requires this general kind of concentration and planning. So if I'm not a very good tennis player, then I've got to think really hard about the whole thing. Like how am I holding a racket and how do I swing the thing? And and that's, that, that's hopeless, right? I can't, I can't do that and have a conversation because I've got to, as it were, do this sort of central control stuff. But as soon as that's very, 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 very fluid and very automatic, I'm sure professional tennis players can, you know, can do a lot of stuff while playing tennis, but it will, it will still affect their tennis for the worse. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure if you had, you know, if you have uh, Novak Djokovic trying to do mental arithmetic while he's playing tennis, it'll, he'll still do mm -hmm. pretty good, but he will certainly be worse at tennis. He'll still be beating the rest of us, but he would be worse at tennis than he would normally be. And, yeah. So I wonder if, I wonder if part of the, is an endogenous in the sense that, well, I mean, obviously when you get good at something, that's endogenous, but this mm -hmm. idea of non-overlapping neural circuitry, because, you know, when people talk about creativity, they always say, well, yeah, creativity is, is often, um, a result, at least this is a hypothesis mm -hmm. of, you know, lots of, of, um, you know, more connections, uh, across different mm -hmm. kind of neural systems than, you know, you would get in, in, in a normal uh, person, I suppose. Um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, presumably if, if you need to have some separation to kind of multitask, does multitasking necessarily, you know, impair, um, you know, being good at multitasking, mm. does this necessarily impair kind of creativity? Yeah, I do. Uh, and and metaphoric, yeah. metaphorical. I mean, I think you, you talk about mm. kind of metaphor and the importance yeah. of metaphor. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm very great believer. Well, I, I'm a great believer in the fact that we're, we're all being incredibly creative all the time, of course. I think we're, we're amazing. We're sort of amazing improvisational machines. And we, and we just don't, we don't really recognize the astonishing creativity required just to interpret the world around us, to interpret other people, to interpret ourselves. You know, this is continual stream of invention issuing for, from every human being, really, is from sort of birth till death. It's just, you know, we are staggering inventors. Um, so, so I do think creativity is really central to what it is to be human. Um, of course, some people are, you know, in a, a very overt way, even more you know, creative than the rest of us, but we are all pretty creative. Um, and I think I'd be, I'm not sure that there's a necessarily a trade-off between multitasking and creativity. I think, first of all, multitasking is largely, it, it, it's, re, it's rare. Um, what we're talking really about are these, these, these sort of special cases, such as you know, super, people are super skilled at things, um, where there does seem to be some degree of automatization, where they can run one process without any central control. Although having said that, even there, there seems to be some residual effects of uh, the central control. So a very lovely experiment um, by Hal Pashler and colleagues. Hal Pashler's at UCSD. Um, very, very, very all, all kinds of wonderful experiments on attention, which very influenced me a lot. Uh, but one, one particularly nice and simple experiment is um, an experiment where you, you're, you're, you're in a, a, a very simple driving simulator. I mean, sit you on a computer, I think. Um, and you're driving, you're driving behind, you're not really driving at all, at all, of course, but you imagine you're driving behind a car you can see on the screen. And um, from time to time, the car will stop abruptly and you've got it, his brake light will come on, you've got to slow down. So you've got to press your own brake pedal to slow down. Um, and at the same time, you've got to report, um, you may have to, from time to time, you have to report something that happens on the screen. So it might be that the, a light comes on or something like this on the, it's not a brake light, some other light comes on or something, something else happens. And you have to, you actually, in some, in one condition, you actually have to say, you know, something like up or down or high or low or whatever mm. it is. Um, so it's just, it's a verbal task. You're picking up a visual signal, um, and th th at the same time as that, you you have to potentially you know, break. And I think perhaps have, have, have to do a bit of steering. The really nice mm -hmm. thing is that the even though the task that the, the spoken task, just saying up or down or high or low, very very simple task, completely trivial, um, this interferes with your ability to break, even if you're a really experienced driver. So you might think, look, I can drive on autopilot. I, I don't, doesn't require any attention at all. I've been driving in these you know, 20, 30 years, whatever. Um, so it must, it's completely automatic. I can chat, I can do anything. But even doing a simple task of saying, you know, whatever it is, up or down, high or low, um, that is slowed 
if you have to break. So essentially your brain is saying, I've got to do some breaking now. Central processes are saying, focus on this and then up freed again. And now we can do this other task. You have to do one, cue it and get it done and then, then move to the other. So that's true even with, even with, uh, um, with, with, with a lot of, a lot of experience. You don't, you don't seem to lose that. So, yeah, but, but so, so I think there is remarkable limits actually to how even yeah. super, super experienced drivers or um, sports people, pianists, uh, you know, how, how serial their minds are, they're still somewhat affected by these sort of basic limitations. Yeah. The example of the airline pilots mm. who, who crashed, you know, one third of the time, mm. that was pretty, uh, pretty, pretty yeah. scary. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's right. So. This is a, a, a rather alarming study where you, you're in a flight simulator and a, a, an aircraft looms. Uh, in, this is in dark conditions. A lot of you know, clearly in the simulator, you've got lots of other instruments to, to work, look about, look at. All of which were on a heads-up display, so they're all on the screen. Uh, so even though the pilot isn't obviously um, looking, they are clearly looking at the the, 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 the the scene in front of them as it's unfolding. A plane can loom into view, really very obviously if you're looking at it. Um, but they don't see it because they're focusing on some other part of the image. They're reading a dial or the, you know. so yeah, right. yeah. So so just having something in view does not make you see it. Yeah. Now I think you you talk a lot about uh, I think what I think it was kind of the William James story, right? Which is uh, about how we interpret our emotions and how we mm. um, you know construct our emotional life, and and this is you know really an act of interpretation. And and when you dig into yes. it and you realize that it's so easily. Um, altered by, by context, right? You, you, you mentioned context as a way of understanding, you know, is this a rabbit yeah. or is this a duck? But you could also ask, you know, am I, am I angry or am I excited or you know, am I yeah. uh, romantically yeah, inclined? And, and, and there's, there's, it's, it's, it's really an act of interpretation in many cases, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So there are lots of lovely studies where by changing the context, you can get people to interpret the same emotional experience in a different way. Um, so one particularly famous one is um, Dustin and Aaron's uh, amazing study on the um, uh, with high and low bridges. I think somewhere very near the University of British Columbia campus, not not on the campus. So the trick there is they 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 get attractive female experimenters to intercept. I think male bridge crossers. I think maybe both genders, but anyway, um, uh, the male bridge crossers and. The question, and they'd get the, the, the male bridge crossers after having walked across the bridge was either a high, scary bridge. It's really quite a, you know, quite a, quite a, quite a large chasm they're going across, or a low, not very scary bridge. The, the male bridge, bridge crossers are asked to do some boring task, and then told at the end, oh, for ethical reasons, I, you, know, you, you, I can give you the option, to, option to take my phone number, and you can call me if there are any issues this has raised, which is pretty unlikely, I think, judging by the study. Um, and the question, what they're really interested in, is how many people take the phone number and how people, many people phone it. Um, and the answer is quite a lot, um, but it's quite a lot higher, some sort of high, you know, something like 40 or 60% higher if you've just walked across a high bridge. So you're a male bridge because you just walked a high, high, across a high bridge. What's going on? Why are you suddenly phoning more? Well, the, the Dutton and Aaron's hypothesis and why they ran the study was, well, you've just walked across a high bridge, you're full of adrenaline. You then meet someone, uh, and it's quite likely you'll think, well, um, this is some kind of, you know, there's some kind of connection here. I know this, what's the what's for this adrenaline? It must be, it must be this person who's talking to me. Um, now, of course it's not. If you were, if you thought for a second, you'd think, hang on, I've just walked across a high bridge. That's why I'm full of adrenaline. But that's, you know, you're in flow of conversation. You're not thinking about that. So you're interpreting this kind of heightened, uh, physiological response as something to do with the person, not with your ex experience. Or another example, which, um, was done by Danny Oppenheimer now at, now at Carnegie Mellon is, um, is, 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 is a very simple experiment where you give people um, e either beautifully photocopied or very poorly photocopied um, pictures of luxury cars. So say you have a, a ja Jaguar and a BMW and what, in one case the Jaguar is really badly photocopied and in the other case the BMW is and you ask them how much they like the, like the car. And you're interested in how much they like, like the car, not the picture. Uh, now, they're, not surprisingly, they're quite strongly influenced by the crumminess of the picture, mm -hmm. so it makes them not like not like the car so much. But the the really cool thing is that Danny also says, in one condition at least, he says, um, "Yeah, but um, I had this terrible problem with my photocopier. I'm so sorry about this. Some of these pictures are terrible." And then the effect. I think really reduces a lot. It doesn't perhaps completely disappear. Um, so when, when people realise, oh yeah, that's a really cool car, but of course the photocopy is terrible, then they 
they can deal with that. They can take that into account. But if you don't tell them about a photocopy, they just think, oh, I didn't, yeah, that just doesn't look that good, that car. And they don't think, yes, but the reason it doesn't look that good is it's obviously terribly photocopied. So it's the same problem. Your, your brain is not being visually, as it were, tickled because of, by this, this image, uh, because of the photocopying so bad. So therefore you don't really like the car so much. Same, the same trick. So, so this is exactly what you were saying. It's this continual process really of, of, of improvisation when we're thinking, do I like this? Do I like this person? Do I like this car? Do I, you know, do, am I, am I amused by this person? Am I irritated by them? Uh, I'm not too sure. Um, and you, 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 you can trick people in these sorts of ways into making essentially the wrong judgment. And that reveals what, that reveals what they're doing all the time. We're always playing this, 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 this improvisational game. Well, you, you mentioned, um, kind of mindfulness and, um, uh, and I think, I don't think you specifically mentioned cognitive mm. behavioral therapy, but you know, both of these are mm. rooted in this idea that, you know, if you become more aware of the, uh, interpretations that you're kind of, um, applying to the raw materials of experience, uh, then, um, this can potentially, um, allow you to either, I mean, sometimes we'll some will say well, have a more accurate interpretation mm. or perhaps a more useful interpretation mm. or a more an interpretation that, that's more, that's healthier. Um, mm. it, you know, it, but, but I think some people might be very upset once they become aware of how much is in fact, uh, you know, retroactive or concurrent interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that the, the, these both those concepts of mindfulness and CBT, I think they are very aligned actually, and uh, with this mm. the kind of perspective. So I mean, and not, you know, there's not a, not a clash there. Um, and I I think the one thing that's so important, I think, is if certainly for dealing with, um, for example, you know, re recurrent negative thoughts, something like that, is is being able to think, oh, there's that there's that interpretation again. You know, I have that quite often. Um, that interpretation that says I'm a very bad person or I totally failed at everything. Well, there it goes. You know, that's just one way of seeing the world and I won't, I'll be seeing it differently in a minute and I'll just push that aside. Whereas if you don't, if you don't think like that, it's easy to think, oh, that's the, that's me. That's, that's the world. I'm seeing, yeah. I'm, see, I'm just looking inside myself and I'm looking inside and saying, oh, no, a terrible person. But no, that's not right at all. Um, and we all have you know, interpretations fluttering about um, which come and go. And one moment we look like a duck and another we look like a rabbit. And so freeing oneself up from thinking, I'm seeing the ground truth here, is I think often very helpful. Because um, so sometimes we really aren't seeing the ground truth and it's terribly dangerous for us to think we are. Um, well, the flip side of that think, is that you, the flip side of that is if you discover, you know, you're, you know, all your, the love of your life is, is an interpretation, right? And, you know, you want to well, believe that this is yes, yeah, you know, something yeah. fundamental. Yeah. I have something, I have a, I, 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 I've thought a lot about this as, as any, anyone would, of course, if you're thinking, trying to make this story um, convincing. And I think the, the story with love, I think really is interesting because I think the way to think about this is it's, it's it, the thing that makes it real is it's sort of dyadic quality. So I think it really is, infatuations, I think, are things that are actually genuinely kind of, kind of ephemeral things or, or rather it's impossible to know quite what, what do you make of an infatuation? It's like, well, you felt some stuff. We, did you even know the person properly? Were you projecting? And it, is that some sort of deep lifelong thing you should hang on to and sort of hold out for forever? Or is it, I mean, you just don't know, right? But, you, but, but it seems natural to think, well, that was just, it's, it's, it's the very one-sidedness of it, which makes it seem somehow kind of ill-defined. And I think the thing about, I think sort of lo love is that it's, 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 it's the fact that it's, recognized by the two people so you're both in love with each other and that is that is a sort of an objective fact right i mean so mm -hmm. i've interpreted you know um i've got this interpretation of my wife and she's got this interpretation of me um and you know i mean obviously who knows exactly um how stable that is but it is a kind of there's something kind of we've kind of a, we've got this kind of joint understanding of the way things are um, it's like co-authoring a novel together exactly, right exactly yes yes exactly so it's not that yes exactly it's like, and it is a novel yeah we've made this novel up but it's our novel and this is what this is how we say it goes and of course sometimes you know we have you know inevitably you have different different perspectives on things um, but if you have that sort of common it's part of your common story um, so i think it's a very real thing um, but it's not inside one person's head and therefore, I think one of the things that's dangerous about the, the, the sense that it is actually is that we can find ourselves thinking, you know, 
do I do I really love you know, X like I should, or do I love you know, love this relative, or do I? You know, you, and if you ask that question and start to look inside yourself, you're kind of doomed to fail, I think, because that's right. not the way you know, sort of these relationships work. And the same would be true of friendships too. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's this kind of mutuality. It's a joint, the jointly authored thing. I think that's absolutely right. That's very pretty nicely put. Well, yeah. So in that sense, when, you know, you say that people are always striving to be in character, um, but you know, love is sort of opening up the authorship of that character somewhat that you're yeah. trying to, you know, be inside of. Right. Yeah. That's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose on a, on a lesser scale, other kinds of friendships and even just conversations uh, to some extent where we're doing, doing a thing together. And that's a thing that's not quite what we'd have done either of us. And that's kind of expanding our, um, expanding our world a little. And of course, deep relationships yeah. do that, that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And also I think the education, right? So when yeah. people come to school, right, part of a reason why they come to school is because they want to, you know, rewrite their character. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, and you know, if you're a good teacher, you can kind of like help move that process along and, and then they imagine themselves to be something that they never imagined themselves to be. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that process of so sort of seeing yourself as a as a as a kind of in a way a, a fictional character of your own creation is quite liberating. Mm -hmm. It's not that you're a, a kind of vaporous, you know, sort of um, uh, trace with with no solidity. It's more that you know, you 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 have con have some control over what character you can become, and it's not limitless. And you, you, I, you, I think an example I give in the book, I certainly always giving to people in conversation is. Um, you're trying to become Charlie Parker if you're an amateur saxophone player. But I think, well, I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll just, um, I'll just sort of try to think myself into the past and see if I can, you know, just play like Charlie Parker. And the answer is, no, you can't. Um, there's only one Charlie Parker. Now, what you can do is you can pick up individual phrases and painstakingly put them together and you'll sound a little bit more like Charlie Parker and, and Charlie Parker himself would always would, would probably laugh at your efforts but still you can you you can incrementally change but it's but it's a process of very very sort of effortful slow habitual um you know, laying down new traces you're learning to you know, do play play in a way you didn't play before but you you can't magic it and that's similarly true with with characters so you know I, I can't suddenly radically change say I'm just going to play the role of you know, somebody completely different from me. Um, I, I just can't, I haven't got the skills to do that. Um, of course, people who are remarkable actors, they are rather, really rather magical. That's a very, very, very unusual and remarkable thing that some people really do seem to be able to, to inhabit other, other personas. But of course, often they would also say that's something that's very, very laborious. You know, they spend, you know, days and days and days in character and you know, there's building up this repertoire of movements and, you know, sort of facial expressions and sort of intonations, which are specific to that person, and they can, to some extent, approximate being another person. But I suppose the general point is we are we we're, we're all so we're, we're we're able to reinvent ourselves and recreate ourselves. And we're sort of doing it anyway, um, and 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 we can't magically just go from A to B where B is anywhere. But we can say, I really want to be a bit more like that, and we can edge that direction. Now I can't play like Charlie Parker, but if I could play the saxophone at all, I could play a little bit more like Charlie Parker than I did before. Mm -hmm. Now you talk a bit about artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and, and you, uh, I think two points you make is one is that, you know, the move from good old fashioned AI to kind of machine learning was, was really driven by kind of, uh, changes in how we, we view the, the human, mm -hmm. um, brain and human psychology. Yeah. Uh, but he also makes the point that, um, you know, for those of us that are concerned about, um, the emergence of, of, uh, uh you know, general artificial intelligence, we, 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 we're not going to get that anytime soon, yeah. but there are certain aspects of the human, um, intelligence that, that are very difficult to replicate. Yes. I'm, I'm very relaxed on the singularity problem. Um, and I think the, so a good illustration of, or a, a, a good sort of indication of, of why, why it's not, not nothing to worry about at the moment is that the big successful successes in machine learning work by using gigantic amounts of data and gigantic neural networks so computational instantiations of things a little bit like um, the way the, where the brain is structured. And, the, and this is an incredible technological achievement. So you build this incredible software network, you can throw enormous amounts of data at it, you train it on, on, with unbelievable, unbelievable amounts of computing power, and it can do stunning things. I mean, it, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the, some, of the, some of these algorithms can, you know, generate text. They can you know, recognize fixed pictures and so on. So the, the, it's really, really astounding. 
But the way they're doing it is really different from the way we're working. And, and, and the way they're doing it is by having to generalizing a very little from a very, very large number of examples. Whereas the human brain is also able to generate, gen, generalize a lot from a very few examples. So you can, for example, a, a thing that's very natural for, for human infants is to be able to see that a teddy bear and a bear are kind of the same thing. And for that matter, a picture of a teddy bear in a book. Um, and these are objectively really, really different. Um, and you don't, or if you, and if you show a kid in a, a picture, in a picture book, you know, here's a picture of a donkey and then you see a real donkey. So they might struggle a bit and I think, well, you know, it's like the same thing, but it's not, it's, it's, you know, they, they can make that kind of leap relatively easily. But the, at the level of the actual um, information flowing through, in, through the retina, that, these are completely different things. So the ability of the human, and, and similarly, we can learn words from incredibly um, or learn, learn meanings from incredibly few examples. You just have to show me one example of a, for a child, you might show, show one example of a, of a donkey and you, you won't know exactly what the boundaries of donkey are. You might think horses are included and so on, but you, you've got a pretty good go and a few more and you've got it. Um, so we're, we're phenomenal generalizers from very tiny numbers of examples. And that's something that is really, really, really difficult for machines to do. And that, that, that so, so that means that when, when AI systems are dealing with very familiar problems where there's enormous numbers of similar problems have been dealt with in the past. They are very, very good. But if they're dealing with problems which are much more open-ended, where new things are creeping, cropping up all the time, then they're going to go into and indeed do struggle. Um, so I, I, I think the human, we, you know, we, we have nothing, nothing to fear. What, what AI will do is it change, it'll change us, change the way we live in a way that um, you know, advances in technology you always have. So my analogy here is, um, is, 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 is horses. So you might say so you, 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 if once upon a time we got about by horse and the motor vehicles came along and you know, horses were, were redundant, but the motor vehicle did not replace, did not replace all the functions of the horse. I mean, it's not that it, you know, it, it mm -hmm. couldn't breed, it couldn't you know, freely reproduce, it, it, it couldn't, um, you know, jump over uh, fences. I couldn't digest grass and all the things that horses, the amazingly complicated things that horses do. We couldn't do any of them. Mm -hmm. But what it really could do is one thing, and it could do it, a very, a very important thing, and it changed, changed the world. Mm -hmm. And I think AI is like that. It's, it's going to take things that used to require lots of human, uh, human brain power to do, and will do them better than we can. Um, but it's not doing it by being a person any more than the, 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 the motor vehicle is, is, is sort of replacing the full complexity of a horse. Now you summarize the book by saying, um, you know, the self, the idea of the self is nonsense and the mm. idea of self-consciousness is, is nonsense mm. on stilts. <laughs> and, you know, in, in a way what you're doing is you're kind of hearkening back to a, a psychology mm. that precedes Freud, right? And you're really going back to yes. Hume and, and, and others. Um, and, and it really does push you more towards this, this literary mm -hmm. interpretation of, of the self. Um, and so even though I think of, you know, what you're doing here is a rejection of, of Freud mm -hmm. and everything that came after, I mean, in many ways, you know, Freud was, yes, was a literary yes. figure, you know, he, he's, mm -hmm. you mentioned mm -hmm. Joyce and Wolf, and I think Freud yeah. is right in there and, and as, as, yes. as a storyteller, um, helping us to try and make sense of our, of our lives with stories. Yeah, I think right? that's absolutely right. I think, I mean, Freud is unquestionably an extraordinary thinker and incredibly brilliant uh, a pretty brilliant writer. And, and he, I think thinking of his, his contribution as a contribution to enlarging our sort of folk, intuitive understanding of, of ourselves in the same way that the literature does. I think that's right. So, um, I mean, for my family have been reading Jane Austen in the last uh, few weeks and that you have this sort of same sense of, um, obviously there's no theory in Jane Austen, but there is this kind of incredible, you know, sort of clever insight into you know, human motivation and you know, kind of strange <laughs> embarrassment and you know, puzzlement and, and how people react to each other in tricky situations. And you have that sense of, oh, wow, yeah, I sort of, I still see, see that a bit more clearly. I've got to understand a little more clearly how, how people deal with situations like this. And I mean, I think that's, you know, that's in the same, it's the same territory as Freud. Um, it's really hard to do that. It's very hard to write anything that makes you see human experience around you in a, in a way that it's, it's, it's different and somehow you feel it's clearer and more insightful. Um, and I think Freud's real contribution is, 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 is a remarkable one, but it's, it's, it's a literary contribution, uh, like, like other great literary figures. Now, I think, you know, the, he didn't see it like that and he would have, he was trying to paint a picture of, you know, the, 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 
the primal forces within the mind and how they interact to produce the, the behavior we see and so on. I, I think that 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 story has not really stood up in scientific psychology for you know, many many decades. But but I don't think Fro I don't think the Freudian contribution is is to be negated. I think it's really really important. It's shaped our shaped us the view of ourselves and shaped our sort of understanding of. Um, Anyway, it shaped, shaped the way we intuitively think about human behavior in a very, very interesting way, but not always, not always a helpful now, way. You can always tell when a psychology department building was built based on where it's located on a university campus. And I remember, you know, when I was at, um, at, at Penn and, and now at Berkeley, the psychology department's buildings were built in the fifties and sixties. And so they're always right next to the education mm -hmm. department. And then when I was at, at, at Virginia, they had a, um, it, it was built in the nineties. And so it was right next to the biology department. And so I'm, I'm thinking maybe, you know, mm. our next psychology buildings will be built next to the English departments. Um, maybe that'll be the, well, I would, I would, I would be delighted if, if, there, if, if that were, which were, were true. In fact, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very, I mean, I, it's very interesting. The connections with psychology and neuroscience are, are very, very deep and interesting, but I think the connections with psychology and the arts in general are super important. Um, and in, in a way, yeah, I mean, my starting point, I suppose, is thinking we are, you have these amazing creative machines, um, and not just in literary context. I mean, I think that is, is astonishing, but even with the visual arts, we, th we tend to think of the visual art, visual creativity being about um, the creation of extraordinary visual forms, which it certainly can be, but just the ability, as, as Leonardo used to talk about, the ability to create um, yeah, an, an image of, 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 from a wall of lichen or some other, some other, um, you know, sort of random structure to be able to see that as a, as a, as a, as a crowd of people. Or, um, or see it. Yeah. 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 So the fact that you, that, that is, that is astonishing. Yeah. You know, that is astonishingly cr creative stuff. And I think we'll understand, we'll, we'll respect ourselves more actually. I think we see ourselves as these kind of astonishing creative one wizards rather than thinking of ourselves as rather rather sort of plodding plodding scientists i think you know the, the human brain is is quite a poor scientist but it's a really astonishing creative engine well nick thanks so much for joining me the book again is is the mind is flat which will um actually uh, help you appreciate the depth <laughs> of, uh, of, of the human mind uh paradoxically i appreciate you joining me today nick This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.